Hey y'all, this is Culture Soup, where tech, culture, and business collide. It's a podcast that spoons up everything hot from social media. I'm your host, L. Michelle Smith, and each episode, we bring you some of the most notable and not yet notable thought leaders in tech, business, and culture. The year was 2017. It was towards the end of the year, maybe in the winter time. And I was either in D.C. or New York. I can't remember which one. But we just wrapped up our Opera America board member meetings for the season. And we were at a reception and I was meeting a lot of people. This would be my first year on the board. So there were a lot of people to meet. And then there was this gentleman that approached me and said that she had he had someone for me to meet and that he felt like we would be great friends. Well, it turns out that his friend was none other than Denise Graves, the opera diva, <laughs> mezzo-soprano in the operatic world. He wanted to connect us because he wanted me to know what she was doing and he wanted her to know what I was doing. At the time, I was still working at the big company, but I was carving out my platform. I had started the Culture Soup podcast uh, by the time she reached out, but it was definitely in the oven and in the works to be launched in 2018. All that to be said, time moved on. I left the company. I started my business and she went on her way too. You know, we first started out as Opera board, Opera America board members. And she got pretty busy. So she wasn't able to make all of the meetings, but she did reach out to me by email. And she shared it with me just the other day because so much has passed. And in fact, even a pandemic that I'd almost forgotten that we made contact back in 2018. She shared with me the email and we were able to reconnect because. She got her hands on my book and she loves it. No thanks. Seven ways to say, I'll just include myself. And she reached out again by email. You know what? It seems a little bit wrong for me not to follow up on an email from someone like Denise Graves, who sung for presidents and potentates and anybody who's important and been on stages like the Metropolitan Opera and the Kennedy Center. She's a Juilliard professor. (laughs) Y'all, <laughs> I you know what? Every once in a while, I bring my opera friends on because it's important for you to know that opera is black, just like it is anything else. And I have the people and the friends to prove it. So without further ado, I want to introduce to you, some of you already know her wonderful mezzo-soprano voice, the rest of you. Get to know her as a person and the work that she's doing to ensure inclusion in the opera. Let's get it. All right, everybody, I'm so excited to have the legendary, fantastic Denise Graves, mezzo-soprano from the operatic world. And you know what? Someone that I look up to so much. She is amazing. She debuted in the Met. I mean, who gets to say that? She's also on faculty at Juilliard School. Denise, so happy to have you with me. I'm delighted to be here, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just, it's a joy to get to know you more and to sit and chat with you. Yes, you know, um, we met ever so briefly by email because someone introduced us that knows you very well. And he came up to me at a reception and said, you got to meet Denise. And at the time we were both on the board of Opera America. Do you remember that? I do remember that. That came from my former manager, Bill Pallant. And he met you at an event and he called me right after it was over. He said, Denise, I met the most spectacular woman who is just so dynamic and on the move. And he said, you two have got to get together. And so he made an e-introduction some years ago. Yes. 
we're chatting. We're, we had one telephone call, but we also exchanged email. Oh, I don't know, three, four years ago. Yeah, something like that. And, you know, when you mentioned it to me, I almost had forgotten. And I said, I said a whole pandemic has happened in between. And it's That's true. Right. But besides that, you know, um, I left my job at AT&T. So much has gone on. But I'm so glad that we reconnected when you reached out to me after receiving my book. Love the book. Mark Skorka from Opera America, which we're both, we're both on the board of, um, got in touch with me and he said, Denise, I've got something for you. You've got to read this. This is from L. Michelle Smith. And I said, wait a minute. I think I know her. <laughs> I think she and I were exchanging email, you know, some years ago. And now yes. he's out there and doing all this amazing work and writing books and 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 role modeling that to your beautiful daughter Aww. who has got those same aspirations and changing the world. So I'm delighted. Oh. Well, you know what? That means so much coming from you because I have so much admiration for you. But you know, before we get going, how about we have a culture soup moment? You ready? Right. I'm ready. Okay, awesome. So I scroll through the social webs all the time to see what people are talking about. And one of the things that I noticed especially during the pandemic, as the performing arts pretty much just went dark, whether it was musical theater or opera and such. The conversation about inclusive arts and inclusion in the opera really didn't slow down. How about you? What, what are you seeing in that area? No, I would agree with that. There is so much um, sincere effort, I know, on the parts of, of general managers. I've had the great opportunity to speak to lots of them who are committed to this not just being a topical thing, but something that's going to actually become systematic and integrated and a part of how we go forward. So mm -hmm. it's not just something for this moment while that's really um, you know, sort of affecting everybody's bottom lines at the moment. Right. What I've been assured of is that it's going to be become a part of the machines at different houses going forward. So I'm incredibly encouraged and, uh, on a lot of different levels because, first of all, they realize that if they're if they have to do this much effort, it means how much it was lacking. Yeah. Yeah. It was lacking yeah. entirely. And that, you know, when they started to look around their corporations and see that there was the same type of people in the room, there was no other voice at the table. There mm -hmm. was no other perspective at the table. Then that was the same blind spot that everybody had. Yeah. yeah. I'm really I, I, I think we're incredibly fortunate to be living in this time right now where we've seen so much change, so much eruption, so much being birth and born during the um, the pandemic. But we've seen so much in these last couple of years, and it's, it feels really wonderful to, to feel like people are really authentic mm -hmm. and sincere with wanting to reshape and, and, and have companies and organizations that reflect the rich tapestry that is the America. Right. Absolutely. You know, it's been interesting. I've been involved with Opera America since probably about 2017. And I've been impressed because it was and is still very exclusive uh, for an art. It was built that way. But to see the hearts and the minds of all sorts of people that are so willing to go to the limits to try and change it, is amazing to me. And that's why I've stuck with Opera America and all of the different companies and, and foundations that are represented on that board because I have seen the most genuine effort that I've seen in a lot of different industries. And, and there are a lot of them out there, especially in corporate America. I really feel that the heart is in the right place. I do too. And I have to say, it feels so good. It feels so good. Like finally someone turn the light on and, and you're seen, yeah. you know, and that's what it feels like. And so we will see what things are like going forward, but I know that people are being positioned and folded in and integrated um, and, and, you know, who will have a voice into how this art form, if we're talking about opera, how that can, how that goes forward. Yes. You know, before the pandemic happened, the two big sellers at the Metropolitan Opera 
was Akhenaten and Porgy and Bess. Mm-hmm. Could not get a ticket. You could, people were calling me all the time, like, can you give me a ticket? Can you give me a ticket? Um, you couldn't get a ticket for it. And I think that those, even though we know that La Boheme, La Traviata, mm-hmm. Carmen isn't going to go anywhere, those are real staples in the industry. Now we see that there's a real hunger for new stories right. and different stories and that, that people are actually coming out to the theater. And that's what we want. That that affects everybody. We all want to see that. We want, We all want to see people... You know, we all want to be able to share this beautiful, beautiful art form and have people enjoy it and have that wonderful exchange. And we need people to come out and come to the theater in order for that to happen and to be and to have these important conversations. I realized that when we did Porgy and Bess, for example, Mm -hmm. which is by one of our great American giants, you know, George Gershwin, but about the black culture, about black life in the South, that for so many people who were sitting on the other side of the proscenium arch, that may have been their only opportunity to really get a glance at what the black experience has been like in America. And so with that, I think comes a tremendous responsibility in how we choose to tell the story, you know, and how we are being seen. Um, That's really, really, really important. And even though the piece itself is dated, you can see some really wonderful things like, Guess what? Black people fall in love and have families Mm -hmm. that they care about and have children that they want to advance forward and have communities that really stick together. And all of that thing that I don't think you oftentimes see because through film and media and a lot of things that have been the way that they've been, Mm -hmm. we've seen a certain kind of a portrayal. Right. Very hurtful to everybody Mm -hmm. that's been hurtful. For sure, that's been hurtful to white people. That's been hurt. That's been very, very hurtful because it has perpetuated a lie and a stereotype that doesn't exist. And when we show through a creative form, like you know, through art and through music, when we have the opportunity to really display, um, even with just that that one piece, all that exists, you know, in the the the, the black experience. People then walk away knowing something that they didn't know before. Right. Um, and w- there were when we could, when we would look back on the other side of the audience, there were a lot of um, African Americans in the audience, but a lot of white people in the audience too. Yes. I know would not have otherwise had the opportunity to learn. That was really where they were learning and seeing and um, and and get a different view. And, and to hear a different story told and different portrayals about people that they could fall in love with themselves, mm-hmm. about people to begin to care about, about people that they could root for. And all of that's important because we've been doing that our whole lives. Yes. All the faces that, of people that we fell in love with, that we were rooting for, that we were hoping for. And now we have the opportunity to show that differently. And the people could fall in love with these characters yeah. and, and 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 really see that at the bottom line, the bottom line is it's about humanity. Mm-hmm. It's about humanity. Yes. And, and that it's never been about good or bad. It's always I mean I mean it's never been about black and white. It's always right. been about good or bad. Mm-hmm. Always been about celebrating each person's humanity. And not everybody has had that experience where they have the opportunity to look at someone other than themselves. Right. You know, the importance of storytelling is so crucial and you've outlined that so well. So that means that we need to see liberties. We need to see composers. We need to see everybody all the way to the back of the house, to the back office, all the way to the front of the house on stage. Speak to how important it is to see people who look like you in roles that aren't necessarily black roles. Oh, that, oh yeah, that's very interesting. That that's a uh, some years ago, years ago at the beginning of my career, I had auditioned for this film. And they said to me, which I'm sure that uh, you know all sorts of actors have this story, I'm sure they mm-hmm. do. And they said to me, "Well, you're not black enough." Oh. Right? So, what did that mean to them? Right. What did that mean? You know, I I grew up in a neighborhood in southeast Washington where I was told that I wasn't black enough. So Mm -hmm. I wasn't black Mm -hmm. enough for the black people and wasn't white enough for the white people. So where do you fall? 
you fall in humanity, you fall in just a human being. So that means that people are operating for, from a stereotype. And for those people in the black community that, that said I wasn't black enough, I saw, also, this is incredibly important because what we have been told is a narrative about who we are that is not in our best interest that in fact is perpetuates a stereotype. And we've believed it too. That's why I said it's hurt everybody. Yes. That's why representation is so vital. It's vital because otherwise somebody else is telling the story of who they believe you mm. are. Mm-hmm. And they don't know you. They've never met you, right? right? They don't know anything about you. And people are people. And it was that wonderful line, of course, that we know that, you know, I think it was Toni Morrison, was it Toni Morrison or... Um, uh, maybe it was Maya Angelou. Okay. That we're more alike, that we are more alike than unalike. Right. But people don't have the opportunity to see that unless you meet someone else. You know, it wasn't until, I mean, I, w- I was 15 years old and I went to Germany and lived with a German family. And that was so exciting for me. And, and I remember a conversation that my Ger- I heard my German mother having in German, of course, um, over the telephone one mm-hmm. morning. She said, we have an American staying here with us. And I remember how that hit me, like, oh, I was an American. And, and I didn't even feel like an, an American in America. Yeah. Like I was like the black girl or the other sure. person. You know, and, and I just remember the pride that I felt mm-hmm. of like, oh, my gosh, I'm an American. And the, and the pride that she uh, the pride that she had in telling that to her friend, the, we have an American staying with us. That's so very, very important because for such a long time they have, you know, they, I mean, those who have been in charge of the narrative, who Mm -hmm. have been in charge of putting images out there that have been negative, that have been hurtful, that have been damaging, that, that, that perpetuate that in film, that perpetuate that in print, that perpetuate that, you know, um, in um, media, all of those things. And unless you have the opportunity to meet somebody else, you don't know. Like, I don't know what it's like to meet, an, a, to, to hang out with another German person until I go there. Right. And I actually meet them and they meet me and they say, oh, I didn't know you were this cool. And I say, <laughs> oh, I didn't know that you were this cool. Yeah. It's not until like you go to Asia and you meet, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time in China and you meet Chinese people and they meet you back yes. and you fall in love with them and they fall in love with you. This is what heals the world. Yes. This is what, otherwise people don't have any experience for themselves. So they just watch what's being fed to them. Right. And what's being fed are these constant lies, mm-hmm. right? That everybody's believed. So when I said that, you know, the black people say that I'm not black, it's because black culture has been so hurt yes. about media telling us who they believe we are to be. So if I don't fall into that, then even my own people say, well, you don't belong here. Oh, yeah. And then white people say, well, you don't belong here either. So where do you belong? Where right. You, you're part of the human race. And so the, to answer that question, Michelle, mm-hmm. it's vitally important. If we look at everything that was happening with the pandemic, right, and we looked at this constant execution, you know, of, of beautiful black men, which we know has been happening the whole time mm-hmm. anyway, been happening the whole time. We've been saying it the whole time, but finally somebody's got the camera on right. and people see it for themselves, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and, you know, I, 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 I was speaking about this the other day and there was this wonderful white woman who said when George Floyd summoned his mother, mm. when he called for his mother, he summoned all the mothers yes, out. Yes, he did. He summoned all mothers all around the planet. Right. Yes. And so and so when we saw this kind of unbelievable, like daily unrest and everything that was going on, why can that happen? Why can people get away with that? Right. And we know that, you know, over 400 years in this country, we've had that sort of thing happening the whole time with lynching, Jim Crow. That's that's been part of the American experience also. Right. But why have people gotten away with it? Well, they've gotten away with it. Because, well, first of all, the, the majority has been in power. And again, they have the same blind spot. But, but more importantly, they've been told a story that dehumanizes black people. And when you dehumanize them, then you can justify yes. treatment because you don't see them as human anyway. Right. right? 
So you, you're able to do that. And that, why is diversity important? Because we need to sit across the table from each other and say, you're just as good as me. Right. Black people are just as good as black people. We care about our children too. Yes. We, about, we, we want to be healthy too, right? We care about education too. We care about the climate as well. We call, you, all human beings you, more or less want the same things. Mm -hmm. Until you have that experience from meeting other people, all you have to go on is the images and the stereotypes that have been presented to you. And then we continue, it just, the cycle just continues to repeat itself over and over and over again because you don't actually have a black friend that you know anything about or, or a white friend that you know anything about or, or, or an Asian friend mm -hmm. or French friend, or and you feel very, very, very differently than when people start talking about, you know, my fam, my 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 own family here in my home, is everything. Right. We've got a bunch of everything, and that's been a great, great blessing to my life, and a and and I hope a gr great blessing because I also inherited when I married my husband. And I also in, inherited a tribe, uh, not just his family, but also the children from his first marriage. Yes. And I, I'm really proud of us. I'm really proud of what we've been able to do as a family and how we have all had to learn and grow and listen to each other. They've had to listen to me right. and I've had to listen to them. We've had to see different perspectives. And this is what's important. If we all make up the United States of America, each life is important. Yes. Half is equally glorious. One one group of people doesn't get to decide what it's going to be like for everybody. Right. Right. You know what? You have done such good work of just being excellent, which has allowed you to bubble up to the top and show up in places where we may not have typically seen people that look like you and me. For instance, you've got a couple presidential ina inaugurations under your belt, right? Thank you have, you. I believe that you sang at the, the home going of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing you there. Um, and, you know, that's the kind of, go ahead. Lots of people. Yes. Yeah, President Ford and, and, and done a lot. I'm, I'm born and raised in Washington, D.C. So I've been a, involved and embraced in the political scene here um, and have participated in a lot of important um, events. That does so much for little black girls, little black boys, little black anybody <laughs> right, right. to see you, even grown people to see you in those spaces. But you touched on something that's really interesting when you went uh, to the point where you were saying that you have gotten criticism from other black people saying you're not black enough. Now, I, I know this. Like I'm so that that's such my story growing up, because, as you know, I'm classically trained as a mezzo soprano. A lot of people don't really understand what that means. They they make the leap to opera, first of all, which it doesn't necessarily mean that it means that I was trained in the classic way. Right. And I did learn a lot of classical music, but I sang all the genres and I would typically get the side eye from a lot of my friends, some family, because I didn't sing gut bucket gospel, which is I love, you know, but there are other people that did that. We don't tend to make room and spaces sometimes for the diversity within our own culture. It's Have you so seen that? All the time, all the time here in Washington, some years ago, they did a tribute um, to Marian Anderson. Mm hmm. Okay, the first African American to sing at the Metropolitan Opera. Right. There was not one opera singer involved in the show. Mm. Not one. Again, that was a, again another blind spot, because you know, I think people think that that belongs. That's a European art form, and that belongs over here. And there are there's lots of wonderful, amazing. Yeah. Ama I mean, you know, amazing artists that have come before. Absolutely. Mary Anderson, you know, Sister Retta Jones, Mary Cardwell Dawson, Elizabeth Taylor Greenfeld, you know, Marie Select, the higher sisters. And then um, Mary Anderson, of course, the great, the great, the mighty, you know, Leontine Price, probably the one, the greatest voices of, of, yes. of our, I'm, hands down. Um, and lots of wonderful artists who are out there today, you mm -hmm. know, beautiful. There, There is an array of excellent artists that even within the culture 
and when these people are planning. You know, so, so this is why it's important. So I want to thank you for having yeah. me on your show, because this is why it's important um, that I'm here. Yes. Because people don't know or they're not in the areas where they would know about an opera singer or learn about different opera singers. Um, and so we are as varied, you know, as a as a as a group of people as any as anyone else. Yes, right? ma'am. Any, yes, ma'am. Yeah, there's a whole span of great excellence and artistry going on in every area. Um, and so we have to learn, you know, to also look at the refined arts as well. I mean, yes. I think a lot of people now know Misty Copeland, mm-hmm. right? Everybody's really, really proud of her. Um, you know, to see her out there dancing as a classical, mm-hmm. you know, a classical artist. And, you know, I'm part of the Kennedy Center Honors, uh, the Artistic uh, Committee. And it used to be very, very early on that that that, that um, particular franchise was just celebrating the refined arts mm-hmm. and now opened up to all, kind, you know, LL Cool J one. Right. One, and now we're seeing all Debbie kinds. Allen. <laughs> Debbie Allen just recently, which was awesome. Fantastic. Yes. Um, and, but, um, but yes, so we all have to learn it's, but it's important that there's representation within the black community as well as to, um, the wonderful artists who are across all kinds of genres of music, because, um, we have so much to offer. We have so much to say. We're out here doing great work for those people who have said, you know, that I wasn't black enough. I've been black from the very beginning. And I got to tell you when I'm over in China yeah. or when I'm in, you know, uh, Russia or when I'm in Ireland, you know, you're black. Mm-hmm. OK, so you can't tell me that I'm not <laughs> black enough because I have been so often the only one in the room. I know that more more so than, you know, someone else. Who's right. With so I know what that means, but I, but but what but what needs to be healed in that statement in saying you're not black enough? is what needs to be healed and what needs to be addressed is because we have been told that this is who you are Mm -hmm. and no one can define who you are, right? You cannot let or assign somebody else who's not you define who you are. But, you know, so that's been very hurtful to the black community because people have, people drank that Kool-Aid. Yes. Okay. Well then this is what I am. Right. This is and if you're not like that, then that means you're not like us. But that's right. a lot. Right. right. Well, and you know, they're showing up and being in spaces and being your authentic black self. But then there's also doing the work. You want to talk about what you're doing with the Denise Graves Foundation? I think it's fascinating. I think it, it speaks to exactly what we've been talking about, about the Denise Graves Foundation. What we we know that and, and with this particular renaissance, this rebirth that we're, we're seeing happen all around the globe, particularly in America, where um, people are really focused on diversity, on equity, and on inclusion, that we uncover and we shine the spotlight on those who have been systematically and traditionally left out of the story. So what we're doing with the Denise Grace Foundation is that we're telling those stories of great American heroes that we never learned about. Mm-hmm. Black people never learned about, that white people never learned about. Those stories that, you know, we just had, and back in um, May 31st, we just had this story about the Tulsa race um, massacre. Right. 100 years, people didn't know about it. Right. You know, people didn't know about it. Um, we're seeing the birth of lots of organizations that are, there's a wonderful woman by the name of Hannah Drake who's doing something called the Unknown Project. And again, it's about celebrating those great Americans who have traditional been left out of the story. So we are going through the lens of music with the Denise Grace Foundation. So we look at somebody like who has served as inspiration for us, and that is Mary Cardwell Dawson. Mary yeah. Cardwell Dawson. Yeah wanted to be an opera singer, Mm -hmm. okay? And so she graduated from the New England Conservatory, which is my alma mater. In 1925, she graduated as a double degree um, with voice and with piano. Now, it took her a long time to get that degree because, you know, they kept making it difficult. They were making it impossible and were hoping that she would quit. So by the time she graduated, she was 30 years old because they just kept giving her the run around. Just move the the finish line. Move the goalpost. Oh, you can't do that. Oh, no, you can't. Anyway, whatever. She finished. 
And then she wanted to get hired as an opera singer. Nobody would hire her. Wow. So she decided that she would create her own company Mm -hmm. like you've done, Mm -hmm. like I've done. Yes. We've seen so many wonderful, mighty women do to say, right. We look and see where there's a problem and how we're going to fix that problem. Right. And if, if it doesn't exist, then we will fill in that void. Exactly. So she she created the National Negro Opera Company, um, which um, is a building that stands uh, is a, an old Victorian home that stands in Pittsburgh, still standing today. Um, it was the longest running, the most successful, and run by this black woman. And what she did was she gave jobs to over 1,800 singers, just singers alone. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then she hired orchestras and the designers and the conductors and the directors and all those people. And then she had to find venues for them to perform all over the world and she, all over the United States. And um, she she had chapters in Cleveland, in Chicago, in New York, in Baltimore, and in Washington, D.C. Wow. Where she, she created these National Negro Opera Companies to give uh, an opportunity to celebrate black uh, artistry from these fantastic artists who were otherwise not getting hired, right. and, you know, clearly just because of the color of their skin. So then she also taught music. So she taught, she taught voice and she taught piano and she taught languages and she starts taught stage direction. And she had, she taught over some 600 kids uh, music, right? One of which was Robert McFerrin, the father of Bobby McFerrin. Mm-hmm. Um, Al Jamal, jazz pianist, who still is alive today. Um, Edward Boatwright, all these fans. She launched the careers of Lillian Avanti. She launched wow. careers of so many incredible people. And then this place, this wonderful monument, which it, it still stands in Pitt, Pittsburgh today, which we at the Denise Grace Foundation are raising money for, mm-hmm. are raising awareness about to get this place rebuilt because it's it's nearly dilapidated, yeah. still standing. It's amazing. And has, has been declared since 1994 the number one on the endangered monuments list. So the young, mm. the, the Historic Preservation Society, it is protected because it is a national monument. But um, this place was also uh, an access house and a safe house. So when jazz greats, giants like Duke Ellington, like Lena Horne, like Count Basie, like Sarah Vaughan, like uh, all these people would come. That was during the time of segregation. They had no place to stay on mm. their tour. They would stay at the opera house. That's amazing. So that is amazing. So, but, and, but, and this, it, she's been called the first lady of opera. Mm. And nobody knows about nobody her. Nobody knows about her. Another nobody. hidden figure in opera. Uh, <laughs> Another number. So what we are concerned with at the Denise Grace Foundation, we are an organization that's about hidden figures, about great American heroes mm. and about bringing those stories to the public through the research, through our programs, through, um, you know, getting into getting um, educational model uh, modules into the public schools, into the music conservatories, the schools of music, all kinds of things like that. And that's what we're doing. That's amazing. And this conversation I had with you and one of your leaders of the organization, Ronald Ronald T. Smith, Smith. it was an awesome conversation. And one of the things he drew out, and you brought this parallel out just then too, so much of what we're doing is parallel. And what Miss Mary did with that opera house was a way to say, I'll just include myself. I love that. It's what we have to do sometimes. It's exactly what you have to do because, uh, again, Again, if if this is being controlled, uh, the way that the country has been unfolding has been under, you know, a white um, dominance, then they're not going to see that. They're mm-hmm. not going to know that um, uh, uh, until they do. And I think that what's happening now is that we're seeing people who are, as, as we said earlier, authentically sincere about wanting to make this country more equitable, more inclusive, more diverse, and reflect who we are, American experiment, that we are an amalgamation of all kinds of different cultures. And that is our strength. And that is our beauty, is that we've got so many different voices and so many different perspectives, and that we can find a way to use this to advance us forward as a nation. Absolutely. Denise, what's coming up for you, for the foundation? What do people need to know? So what's coming up for me, which I'm incredibly excited about, we were just talking about um, our foundation and Mary Caldwell Dawson Project. I am doing the musical, uh, the, it's, well, it's called a play with music. Okay. 
about the life of Mary Caldwell Dawson. And that's yeah. going to be this summer um, debuted at Glimmerglass Music Festival in Cooperstown, where the Baseball Hall of Fame is, um, mm -hmm. um, on August 5th. Um, and so we're so excited about that. I, in fact, I'm leaving in just a couple of days to begin work work on that. Sandra Seaton is the librettist mm. and Carlos mm. Simon um, wrote the music for it. And it's gonna be about the life of Mary Cardwell Dawson. Um, and so that is upcoming. Um, we've got the big launch of the foundation, which is coming up next year in 2022. Very, very excited about that. I also have the tremendous honor and the great responsibility of making my directorial debut. Oh, um, wow. I'm directing an opera. I'm directing an opera which that I've had a great amount of experience with on the other side of the Presidium Arch, but now this is a very, very new and daunting assignment as a um, director. Well, I for think you're up for it. Thank you. Well, I'm certainly learning and I'm, and I'm open to learn from some of the greats. I'm, I've got a, a, a meeting coming up this week with Bartlett Shear, who's going to help me. And, and, you know, Kevin Murphy has been helping me and um, Francesca Zambella has been helping me. And I've been reaching out to those successful um, directors in the business and asking, please help me, please school me, please, you know, you know, I, I have a great experience with this opera, but being on the other side of the stage is quite something else. So that is something that's occupying, uh, taking up a lot of thought traffic, um, creating a lot of thought traffic at the moment is uh, making this directorial debut. And, and then I've got another one after that one. So I've, I've got some, um, you know, operas that I'm going to be directing coming down the line. And then I still have the career. I still have a lot of things that are going on with there. We return to the Metropolitan Opera in the fall with Porgy and Bess, which wow. I'm thrilled. About. We just got that news the other day. So we're thrilled about that and making sure that everybody is vaccinated and yeah. that everybody is going to be safe and that we can return to the theater and take turn off the ghost light, lift up the curtain yes. um, and, and get back to what it is that we know how to do and being able to um, tell important stories uh, like that of the, the Porgy and Best story. So yeah. Um, yeah. I'm returning back to the theater. So all of those wonderful things, you know. Denise is so exciting. Listen, where can people follow you on social media? Um, at Graves Montgomery. My married name is Montgomery also. So at Graves Montgomery, but also at Cooking with Denise. I host a cooking show. Yes. That that people can um, follow that on Instagram. You can follow what we're doing at the Denise Graves Foundation um, on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, through our websites, uh, all of those different things to find out what's going on, what's in front of us. And um, um, yeah, I, I'm incredibly proud of the group that we have assembled at the foundation. We've got a lot of incredible, dedicated souls like uh, Ronald Smith, mm -hmm. who you met, Linda Gaynor, Simone Harcum, Kit Emery, you know, Gilbert Hernandez. We've got wonderful people who feel as passionate as I do about, um, you know, getting those wonderful stories out there and celebrating some of our great heroes and these people who have allowed us to have had the careers that we've had, like Mary Cardwell Dawson, who's late, who was an incredible trailblazer. And the reason that we have the careers that we have is because of the work that she laid down. Right, right. The reason that we know Leontine Price, the reason that we know Marian Anderson is because of the work that she did. It's amazing. And you said she took about 40 artists to the Met and we did we don't even know about that. 500. 500 black artists. Wow. Black artists to the Metropolitan Opera. People don't know that. That's they, crazy. They performed a wonderful work by um, Clarence Cameron White, who was himself a violinist, but also a composer. They, they did a piece called Uwanga. And, um, you know, they were not allowed by the unions at that time to perform standard repertoire. Mm -hmm. So they, they, when they came, they had to bring everything. Their new, their, they had to bring their own box office. Wow. Even, you know? um, they had to bring their own opera and their own people, their own stagehands, their own, you know, everything, their own orchestra, conductor, director, designer, dancers, everything. But over 500 people, you know, to the Metropolitan Opera House and people don't, aren't, aren't aware of that and aren't aware of the work that she, but we are picking up that mantle. Because we have that responsibility, because we are her children and we are the benefactors of the work that she and so many others like her have done. 
Um, and so that's our job now to carry that forward. Yeah. Well, God bless you, Denise, for taking the helm on this project. It's so exciting. I liken her to the Madam C.J. Walker of opera. Because she just she just did the thing. She became an entrepreneur and she blessed so many artists just by her work. And it's so exciting. I can't wait to hear more about it. And Denise, I'm so glad to call you my friend and my sister. I hope you'll come back on the show sometime. Again and again and again. Thank you for everything. Thank you for your support. Uh, thank you for your prayers and oh, your yeah. uplift because we're going to need that as we continue to journey forward. We're going to need support from everybody. So I, I do appreciate that. Well, I'm right that. there with you. Thank you so much. Thank Ms. you. Hell. You have a great day. Thank you, dear. Bye. I loved everything. <laughs> Thanks so much. Bye-bye. The Closure Soup Podcast is a production of No Size Communication, LLC. The Culture Soup Podcast is a registered trademark of No Silos Communications, LLC.